Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for accepting me a little bit later than usual. Um, those of you that I do know already, those of you already using the kit, James is going to be around at the end. So if any of you do want to film any personal testimonials about how good the kit is, then you'd be, uh, you'd be welcome to. Don't worry about that. So um, a bit of a quick presentation for you today. The reason we're filming it as well is we can use it as a resource for you all, some of the questions we've asked. We're also doing some work with Libby Haydock from BBC Three to try and put a documentary together about this kind of stuff to show the, the good that it's doing. Because in the UK, um, it can be, a, a, although it's a necessary evil, a lot of people don't like talking about mechanical restraints. So a couple of things we found, we found it's good to talk about soft restraints instead of mechanical restraints. And on Wednesday this week, NICE have got a board meeting where they're traveling around the UK and you can ask them questions. So one of the things we're doing is we're going to go along the same as we've done today, ask them about some of the guidances and how it can be a little bit ambiguous and misleading and see if we can have some, some new terminology put out there to, to aid people. Um, the reason my presentation is called Stuck in the Middle is because I learned about something whilst I'm on my travels called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Has anyone heard of this before? No, I haven't. And since I've heard it, I can't unhear it. So it reminds me of, uh, of this song. So basically, you'll remember this song from two, what, two, two sources. Either you're old enough to remember when it was in the charts, or you'll remember a shaving accident in Reservoir Dogs, which is where I, uh, where I remember it from. So the Dunning-Kruger effect basically describes a situation where people that know very little about a situation, uh, a circumstance, actually think they're experts on it. The research goes back, yeah, you can relate to this already, can't you? It's like the first two weeks of X Factor. I don't watch X Factor, but I love watching the train wrecks in the first two weeks. So Dunning-Kruger effect. They found out that the people that were, had the most conviction about subjects and believed um, in what little they knew about it, the more convicted they were. So they surveyed people about where they think autism came from. Where do you think autism came from? And some people said that they knew more than the doctors, but a staggering 36% claimed that they knew more than the scientists. When they looked at that minority group with the lowest knowledge, they found they were the people that were out there saying, no, this is, this is awful, we need to change it. And they were also more prone to believe celebrities than actual scientists. I mean, whatever next, will we have a celebrity billionaire in office? No. <laughs> so I want to share with you some of these cases because this is where I feel I am. Very often I'm talking to people who are against the use of mechanical restraints. They're against soft restraints. We could talk about prone, we could talk about pain compliance, and they've not really looked at the facts. They don't really know um, what's out there. They're just saying, I don't like this, and I'm going to do everything to stop you from getting this implemented within our service. So um, I took over the soft restraint business that I worked for with Mark Williams in 2015. And since then, we've made quite a lot of advancements internationally, mainly because uh, overseas, they are strapping people to beds. They are using mechanical restraints quite a lot. So we walk in with a far less restrictive alternative. Now, in the UK, as most of you know, it can be far less restricted to use mechanical restraints than it can be to do prolonged manual restraints for hours hours on end and, and repeated seclusion and um, rapid tranquilization and things like that. So I'm going to share with you some of these. I haven't got much time to go through them, but there's lots of different bits on our website about these. We do some work in New South Wales. Um, South Australia are using us quite a lot because they've got a rule where they won't put anyone under 12 in seclusion ever. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was under 12, the best thing you could have done was sent me to my bedroom to calm down, give me some space but they don't give kids that. And some of these kids have suffered awful trauma, and as soon as they act out slightly, they're held for hours on end, and they will struggle and struggle and struggle. So the, the soft cuffs we use, and the soft restraint belts, and the waist restraint belts used by some high secure, um, they're allowing people to do things like play Xbox. There's somebody that was really horrifically self-harming a few months ago, and I called the service we provide the training for, and I said, how's things? They said, oh, he's sat next to me watching Shrek. You know, massive advancements where these people weren't allowed to interact with others, but by the addition of soft restraints or mechanical restraints, they're able to take part in meaningful activities and, and, and actually get better. You can't just shut people away and, and hope that they get better. So let me break this down for you. We've already got a framework in the UK that allows us to use work equipment. Mechanical soft restraints are items of work equipment. What it says is we must have safe plant and systems of work, safe use handling, of people as well as objects, storage and transport. IITS, we're all familiar with that. And safe workplaces, including how you get into workplaces and how you get out of them with these people that you're handling. So when you look at that straight away, we can already see some of the challenges we face. 
And if soft or mechanical restraints would make this safer for either party, it's something we must have a discussion about. So there's procedures for imminent danger. And what it says, first of all, competent people should be appointed. Now, I've heard this discussed quite a lot, but the definition I've got for competent people is knowledge and experience. You can have years of experience, but if you haven't got the knowledge and the qualifications to back that up, it doesn't always work. And the opposite, you can be an academic with no operational experience and you can come unstuck. So when we're deciding if somebody's competent to actually be saying no and actually be saying we can't have this equipment used, then these are, the, these are the kind of things we should be talking about. So we have to identify training requirements. What training is required so that people with specific responsibilities can carry out their tasks? What's the premises like? The amount of time people say to me, we need you to teach us how to restrain someone and get them up that flight of stairs or down that flight of stairs. Now, I don't know about you, but most of the time when I'm at home, I fall upstairs. That's where I'm happy and I like it and I'm dead chilled out and my heart rate is, is level. It's going to be very difficult to think about get, doing that in any other circumstance where it's anyone other than just me. Escape routes, can we get in, can we get out? What's the emergency systems and lighting like? I was recently at a high secure looking at their training facility and I loved the idea that they were dimming the lights within some of the scenarios. They were making it a little bit more realistic. They were also messing with temperatures to see how staff would react when the palms do get sweaty. Are they then able to, to maintain the holds? Um, and equipment required for dealing with the emergencies. We've got evac chairs. We've got stretchers. We've also got mechanical restraints that can aid with moving people or keeping people in one place and, and containing them. And communication with emergency services. This is something we're getting better at in the UK with the use of force bill coming along as well, which those of you will know is just a continuation of the memorandum of understanding, which was between certain units and police forces. We look at here at NICE guidance. You'll be feeling familiar with NG10, and it actually specifically talks about restraining belts, it talks about handcuffs. So we're aware of this. NHS England sign off on equipment quite a lot. The CQZ, I have regular chats with them about how this kit's being used. But there's other people that are maybe putting guidance out there that can be seen as being ambiguous sometimes. So the MOU talks about the police may be called and they may have access to certain things. They do have far more risk reduction measures than we have. They've got access to um, tasers and things like that that obviously we, we don't have access to. Is it the best course of action for police officers to be coming and dealing with someone they've been told is dangerous in the way they would deal with somebody that's on the street? Chances are not. We're getting better dementia awareness. We're getting better autism awareness training for the police. But their response is always going to be the same. They're going to make sure officers don't get hurt and members of the public don't get hurt. This could result in deaths, and in the past it, it has done. So there are health provider commitments here. And this is quite important because as we start to say to the police, we don't want you responding to these incidents because we don't think people with mental health should be being put in police cells. We don't think they should be put in police vans. There's got to be something there to take place of that. So it says that all clinical interventions should be managed by the health providers. Unless there's a, a known risk where nothing can be done to plan for it, then it should be the health providers that are doing these kind of things. Taking samples and injections. Uh, health providers should be doing the risk assessment. They shouldn't be asking the police to come and solve their problems. They should have something in place to stop this from getting too far. Steps that are reasonably practicable to safeguard other patients and staff during incidents which it relates and restrictive interventions allied to psychiatric care. Um, one trust we work with, I really like this, they were taking somebody out to have kidney dialysis and there were so many complications, so many staff injuries. So they brought a machine to the establishment. Now, some of you may be familiar with, some of you may not. This is the hierarchy of risk control. It's known by health and safety consultants as ERIC prevents death because of the letters that make it up. If you're not familiar with this, it's a good idea to get familiar with it because often if you're talking to organisations about having decisions made or looking at different sets of purse strings, the health and safety person or the manual handling lead are the people that can point you in the right direction or sign things off. This is day one of any health and safety course, understanding how to do a risk assessment. The first test is, can we avoid it? If we can't avoid it, what can we do to reduce the risk of restraining someone? Before we consider putting our hands on someone and physically holding them, because it can be traumatic, ask ourselves this. Might it be better to give the person some space or might it be better to take them to a seclusion area where they can calm down? Now, I've put control in red because here's a fact we all know. Holds 
physical intervention, manual hold, they don't always work. And usually somebody suffers discomfort or somebody gets hurt. So if there's an alternative to that that fits before there, they're the things we should consider. Because I've seen it happen. I've seen people turn up to court with the shiny certificate and the manual saying, these are the techniques I've learned, I'm gonna be fine. And they don't get to justify the control measure because these are the questions they're asked first. Has this happened before? Yes, oh, it's a known risk then. So it's subject to risk assessment. What have you got in place to reduce the risk? Have you got reasonable adjustments in place for these people? What's your seclusion system like? How do you get somebody there? How long do you keep them there? How do you manage them while they're in there? And only then would you get to justify the control measures. If control measures aren't enough, the next step we move towards is PPE, personal protective equipment, which again, mechanical and soft restraint come under that. They're work equipment. They're also there for protection, protection of the patient, protection of the, the general public, protection of the staff at the end of the day. And D for me, discipline's a massive one. If you're stuck in one of these for any period of time, don't keep doing the same thing and expecting different results. That's the definition of insanity. Think to yourself, okay, right, if we have to keep restraining someone, is there something else we can use that's least restrictive? That might be an item of mechanical restraint equipment. It might be a case of giving somebody an area or a space where they can exist in. But doing the same thing isn't conducive with a risk assessment, and that's what I'm trying to show you here. So when we talk about risk assessments, we're talking about manual handling. Okay, it's the manual handling of people, but let me just take you through a quick risk assessment. Now we work in internationally. One of the things I found internationally is although people like British qualifications, they don't like me talking about British legislation. So a lot of the, the training packages we have, I've had to tailor a little bit. And we've based it on the NEBOSH qualification. The NEBOSH is an international standard for health and safety. And it's something that's worked really well for us when we're talking to people about using soft restraints. So first of all, you're gonna look at the load. So just have a look at this from us rest restraining people. Is the load heavy? bulky or unwieldy, difficult to grasp, unstable, hot or potentially damaging. Yes to all in some situations. Your individual capabilities. As we get older, we start to carry injuries. Um, we start to deteriorate slightly. So does it require unusual strength or height? It might not for somebody who's very young, but what are our staff, what's our staff's capabilities? Is it hazardous to people who have a health problem? There's all sorts of health problems within our workforces. We've got to be sensible in the expectations. The task, are people holding loads at the distance, a distance away from the trunk? Most of the time we're not, but if somebody's trying to bite at you, spit you or get to you, you instinctively move away. You move your arms away from your trunk. What's your body movement or posture like? Depending on the height of you and the person you're working with, pushing or pulling distances, stopping suddenly, you, you get the idea. You, you can't manually handle and risk assess people if people do not want to be moved or they're struggling. That's where we start to look at equipment. And health and safety legislation is quite clear on this and guidance. What it says is, if there's a mechanical method of doing manual handling which is safer than the actual manual handling activity, you should always choose the mechanical method. So you think about forklift trucks moving pallets around warehouses all the time. You think about sh going shopping. Who shops at Lidl, Aldi or Netto? Who shops at Waitrose or Sainsbury's? I'll cut the room in half. <laughs> <laughs> so, when, so when my wife's at home, we go to Aldi, which is great because you get shopping for about 20 pounds. When my wife's not there, I go, we don't have Waitrose, we have Booths. So I go to Booths because you can park and it's nice and it smells nice and people always help you with your shopping and you get a little token to give to charity. It's great and you feel good when you're walking out. Aldi checkout experience is emotional. <laughs> you get this much to pack your shopping and what's it like? It's thrown at you, isn't it? And it's a race. Do you know why that is? It's because of work-related upper limb disorders. So Scandinavian and German supermarkets bulletproof themselves against claims. They say don't help with the packing, be nice to customers, and then watch them go. But in the UK and America, we twist, we turn, we lift, we pull, and then we claim, and we constantly pay out. So if you've got tins of beans and bacon and bread that aren't fighting back, and you've got big corporations doing that, what are we doing? What are we doing sometimes when we're looking at holding people for, for hours on end? Mechanical restraint NG10. So this is when a lot of people come back at this and they say, oh, we're not allowed to use mechanical restraint because of nice, nice guidelines and nice guidance. Um, if you read all the way through the guidance, it's actually got a bit of a caveat at the end, which a lot of people forget about. What it says is 
Nothing in this guideline should be interpreted in a way that be inconsistent with complying those duties. Now, whether this was added in later or not, I don't know. But don't forget, guidance, especially if it's non-statutory, in the hierarchy of law, you've got your health and safety law, which sits way above that in the first place. So by all means, we read guidance and we digest it, but we have to look more broadly. We have to look at why we're doing this. And as Eric Baskin said at a conference I attended some years ago, to say that you could only use mechanical restraints or handcuffs in one setting would be like to say we live in a Lego world where the nasty criminals are over there and the poorly people in the hospital and the children are there. We don't live like that. Sometimes there's not enough beds in certain settings. So where does that person go whilst they're waiting? They need to be looked after in the same way we look after anyone else, don't we? So what I was talking about before with my analogy of the supermarket, um, where possible, avoid manual handling. This is to stop the musculoskeletal disorders and the work-related upper limb disorders. <laughs> are, the, uh, are the gangways clear to allow people to move? Does the work area affect the handler's posture? Um, this is, makes me laugh. Is the load stable and readily grasped? No. And if it was, would we be manhandling that person anyway? No, it's, it, it's not something we'd do. And the hands are not more than shoulder width apart. Depends on how big the person, doesn't it? PPE should not interfere with the performance of the task. If anything, it should aid the performance of the task. If there's items of work equipment that can protect people, then they're, they're there. So in the UK, we've got Pure. Uh, each country's got its own set of rules on this. And if you look at the international standards for health and safety, it's exactly the same as this. So what this says is, if you're procuring work equipment, it must be suitable for the intended use. The amount of time people have said to me, oh yeah, we just use the strap on the stretcher to restrain someone and hold them down. Okay, well that, that's not what it's for. There's something that's been designed for that. Restraint belts aren't something that our company invented. They're invented in um, the US after people were using rolled up towels. They would roll towels up and they would hold people down. And people said, look, these aren't towels aren't for that. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy makes us think they're for everything, but really, towels are just for drying yourself. So let's make a belt specifically for holding someone down. The, the equipment's for there. This should be safe for use, maintained in a secure condition. Inspected, who are they inspected by? By staff, before and after use. If they are used for lifting people, then they're subject to other regulations, depending on which, uh, which area of the world you live in. This should be used by people who've had training, and if you're buying this kit as well, I mean, there's loads of different companies out there selling mechanical restraints. Do your homework on this stuff. I, I've worked with so many organizations that don't know where the kit's from. They've got handcuffs that look like something medieval. They've got things that they've purchased off the internet. Now, if you go out there and do buy this stuff, I do a lot of test purchasing, just be careful. Because if you start trying to buy things like handcuffs and soft restraints through Amazon, it completely ruins your because you bought you might also like. <laughs> for about six months. <laughs> <laughs> should come with medical testing. It should come with a training program. We've been working with some airlines and they've said to me, oh, we've already got this kit. We've bought it in. Section six of health and safety requirements says if you're going to sell somebody something, you have to provide them with training. So there's a lot of inconsistencies, inconsistencies out there. But unfortunately, it's until somebody gets sued or dies that these kind of things don't come boiling to the surface. So the work we've done in Australia, I just want to share a couple of case studies with you. Um, some ingenious things going on over there. That's actually a, a shield that's made of fabric and, and it was for the juvenile training centre. So rather than going in with plastic shields, they had an alternative which, which was sponge on it. Again, not sort of asking for your view on this, I'm just telling you what we've come across as we've been out there. Um, Brisbane Police were great. We did a demo with them and talked to some of the kit and um, Silverwater and Malabar are using our kit because they had somebody that had been in seclusion for a, a very long period of time. She, she just couldn't come out of seclusion. When she did, she was prone to attacking members of staff. Members of staff were nervous. Um, the whole attitude and the environment that she was in wasn't a conducive one. With the safe holding system introduced, which is a belt which has got soft cuffs attached to it, either held to the front or to the rear, it allowed her to take part in activities, but because of that concentric circle of protection, people felt comfortable and they could obviously uh, deal with it from that way. The plan now, as we find in most establishments, and some of you will, this will ring true with you, once it's been used once, there's a chance there where it can be used uh, across the, the other services. We've got a contract with a cruise ship operator as well. They had some real serious challenges. If you go into YouTube and type in Carnival Legend, you'll see an incident that happened in Australia. 
It involved a family of 40 people that kicked off for three days. Now, if you're at sea, there's no police you can call. It's going to take people a while to get there. Um, the camera footage of the people on the ship was the most horrific. Images of security kicking people and dragging people to the floor and people getting improvised weapons. So based on some of these incidents, we had chats with other cruise operators. One of them was a, one that did a cruise to Disney, and they had a particularly alarming incident where a man had given up his cannabis addiction since 13 years old, now 25 years old, went on a Disney cruise with his family and decided to replace his cannabis addiction with alcohol. Didn't go too well. He had an episode on the ship and he ended up being strapped to a stretcher for three days and just repeatedly sedated. Now, you all know the implications of that. So with alternatives of the soft restraint equipment and a framework of de-escalation to try and stop them using this, it's something that every, everybody's really bought into and I can see it minimizing a lot of the incidents. We had an incident in the UK, along with many, I've got lots of case studies, and again, some of these are from guys that are in the room already. Um, somebody that's faced upon a repose mattress, no quality of life, all sorts of issues of him being lay on his back, being fed, and when he got up to the toilets, he'd try and kick off. With the addition of the soft restraints, one around the belts, one around the knees, it allowed him to get better. It allowed him to be able to take trips to the toilet. When they were sure that he wasn't going to harm himself or others, they could get him to play cards sit and have meals with other people. And then by using the kit, which is modular, so instead of having arm restraints and limb restraints, just leg restraints, gave them the alternative to let him take part in computer games and things like that. Are there any questions on what I've covered so far? Thanks very much, sir.